I'll kick this session off seeing as we only have one hour. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Daniel Walker, tōku ingoa. No mai hare mai. Welcome to the Science Communicators Association of New Zealand Conference for 2020. SCANS is a network of people who tell stories about scientific topics, holding regular events for people who are keen to hone their storytelling skills and connect with like-minded professionals. Uh, my name is Daniel Walker. I'm a media advisor at the Science Media Centre. Managing the audience questions is my co-host, Veronica Maduna. She's a scientist journalist and New Zealand editor of The Conversation. Um, the Q&A today will be at the end of this uh, panel. Um, you guys are welcome in the audience to write your partai or questions in the Q&A box down the bottom. At any time, you should see it down the bottom. If you're not familiar with Zoom, click on that, write your questions in. It'll really help us out if you um, make a note of who you're directing your questions to as well, so we can keep this event flowing. Um, you will have seen the pop-up as well at the start, but I'd like to make it clear this session's being recorded um, and will be available for viewing later with closed captioning. Today's session is a panel of journalists sharing their perspectives and experiences of COVID-19. So this pandemic is one of the biggest science news events of a generation, um, and today we'll be hearing what it's been like behind the scenes as journalists worked through a national lockdown getting good science and public health information out to the public, striving to cut through misinformation and holding officials to account. Joining the panel today is Jenny Saw, a One News reporter in the middle of lockdown. She helped the Science Media Centre run an urgent media training session for COVID-19 researchers, helping them prepare to be flung into the unprecedented media spotlight. We also have Mark Adolda, a political reporter at Newsroom. He attended many of the 1 p.m. coronavirus briefings with the Ministry of Health. Uh, Eugene Bingham uh, co-hosted Stuff's Coronavirus NZ podcast, providing a daily wrap of the latest news, along with a bit of morale boosting. And joining him on the screen there is uh, Kate Newton, currently at Stuff as a full-time data journalist. Uh, but through lockdown, was RNZ's data team was in part of uh, RNZ's data team crunching the daily COVID-19 statistics. And we are also joined by Jamie Morton, the New Zealand Herald's resident science reporter, um, who saw all other good science topics go out the window and becoming the resident COVID-19 science reporter. Um, so I will pass over to the speakers now. They're going to do a quick brief um, uh, explanation of uh, what they want you to know about um, uh, COVID-19 experience for journalists. Um, after we've run through them all, we'll go to some Q&A from the audience and some pre-prepared questions. So first of all, I'll hand over to Jenny Saw. Hi everyone, thanks so much for um, joining. Um, so I suppose um, when uh, we heard that we were going to lock down TV, the TVNZ newsroom um, was very quickly split into two teams. Um, I'm sure it was probably the same with many other newsrooms. We had Team Red and Team Blue, we worked um, alternating shifts to ensure that we didn't mix. Um, so I guess the communication between the two teams was really vital. So we had a lot of sort of handover notes and a meticulously kept diary to make sure that we weren't um, doubling up on each other in terms of um, researching stories or, um, you know, with our story ideas or um, even approaching people for interviews. Um, we had to cut quite a few of our shows over lockdown um, and reallocate um, those resources um, to the 1pm press conference, um, which we showed live daily, um, as well as the 6pm news. Um, for example, I um, normally produce and uh, present the late news and um, the late news was cut and we um, all went into the um, six o'clock reporting team. Um, I actually think that everything ran quite smoothly. We had a, um, we kind of everyone knew what they had to do with people transcribing all of the 1pm presses so that we knew um, where all the sound bites were. Um, and, you know, we had very, we had a lot of meetings to make sure that we were all clear on our angles and what sound bites we were using, because at the end of the day, um, we were kind of all reporting on the same thing and we didn't want to step on each other's toes. Um, I think as a journalist, I never felt more like the eyes of the country were on us um, than over level for lockdown, um, over level for lockdown. I think um, by just hearing the feedback on social media emails that we were getting, also our ratings, we could tell that everyone was watching um, and it was quite a bit of responsibility really. Um, 
but I think at the same time, I actually never felt more in touch with um, the public, the people who were watching, because they were messaging us and asking us um, questions and um, telling us about their concerns. And we were able to then um, direct those questions and concerns to um, the authorities and endeavor to answer them. Um, uh, you know, we also had a lot of sort of questions about people um, from people confused about restrictions, worries about PPE, things like that. And we were um, we tried to do lots of sort of explainers, especially using our um, AR graphics, which we've been really trying to hone over the past couple of years. Um, so in our newsroom, there were some pretty clear health and safety rules that were set out from the very beginning. Um, like cleaning all of our film equipment when we were out and before we came in, um, how we greeted and interviewed people, um, uh, and even sort of how we worked with each other. Our desks had to be, be sort of split up so that we were sitting a little bit further from each other. Um, I think the hardest thing for our newsroom was that the communal chips bowl was gone. So we normally had chips and drinks on a Friday and couldn't do that anymore. Um, in terms of getting interviews, I actually found it easier um, because everyone was at home and everyone was available and um, no one had anything to do. <laughs> and so we could just sort of um, say, hey, could we Skype you? And um, people were um, pretty happy to help out, really. Um, uh yeah you know we couldn't drive out to meet anybody so it was it actually ended up being very efficient we could um you know get interviews quite quickly um having said that we are a visual medium so we really needed sort of more than just heads on computers um in our stories so um we relied a lot on members of the public um, filming for us actually um, so we had a lot of amateur um, cameramen um, or you know cameramen and women all around the country um, filing for us which was really wonderful um, especially I think I remember doing stories on Anzac Day and and Easter um, just getting people to tell us how you know how they commemorated and how they celebrated um, when we were able to visit people again we still we had a rule that we weren't allowed to enter people's rooms so we had to get um, quite creative um, I remember wanting to film families watching the 1pm press conference or the government announcements and we had to say hey do you have a tv that's near a, a, a glass ranch slider or near a, um, a window so we could shoot from from outside but get you guys reacting um and you know on days where it was quite miserable and raining we had to make sure that people had um you know shelters outside their homes so that we could come and not get drenched um we also had our sort of mics on big long boom sticks to make sure that there was a lot of social distancing um and in terms of filming our interviews we made sure there were establishing shots to um so that people at home knew that we were standing quite far away from each other um and that we weren't breaking any rules um yeah so uh, i think I think for us health and safety was really important especially given that we had to visit a lot of sort of high risk places like care homes and um you know like the airport um hospitals and things like that I think even at level one we're still pretty conscious of all of that um I think we all you know a lot of our journalists are going to places where COVID cases have been to go and get shots <laughs> Um, and that can be pretty risky. So, yeah, definitely we're still um, even now making sure that we're being as safe as we can be, which means that um, the chip bowl is still not back, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenny, for that. Um, I'll pass over to Mark Dolder from Newsroom now. Um, hello. Uh, I think the sort of first thing that I want to say is um, you know, for me personally coming into the pandemic, uh, I was not a health reporter and had never written about health before and not done a whole lot of science either. Um, you know, our health reporter uh, was Laura Walters and she left in December. Um, so right before the global pandemic, which uh, became the biggest story of the year or the decade maybe. Um, so that was uh, fun. And I just sort of ended up, I guess, becoming the de facto COVID reporter for Newsroom in part because I picked up a few of the early stories in I guess really early March, um, more mid-March maybe, uh, about things like ICU capacity and, and um, you know, health system readiness um, and, and just sort of fell into the role of, of doing that. And I think a lot of, it worked out all right. I they feel like I have a good grasp on, on, 
the health system and COVID-19 and virology and genomics now, uh, much better than I did uh, in January. But, um, uh, you know, I think that's sort of an example of how, um, uh, I guess, improvised a lot of this was for a, a lot of news organizations, just like it was for every business and, and every person probably in, in the country. Um, you know, we're, we're a pretty small team in Wellington. There's, uh, at the time, there were three of us full-time in the office and two of us who uh, worked full-time but were sometimes in the office and sometimes not. Um, so breaking that up and, and not being able to necessarily be um, directly face-to-face -face discussing your plans every morning was quite a bit different. Um, we didn't exactly have teams. I guess each person was their own team. No one would really be in the office if someone else was already in the office. Um, and we sort of had a running roster for who would come into the office each day to, um, to attend the, the daily 1 p.m. Brief, briefings. Um, you know, the logistical issues, I think, were, were fairly easy in the end for us to sort out because, you know, we're an online outlet. We don't have the um, footage and, and audio needs that some others do, the, the broadcast reporters. Um, from a sort of broader media environment perspective, I've been consistently impressed with how media in New Zealand and overseas have, have dealt with the, the pandemic. You know, there's a world in which people um, sensationalized it or, or let it become quite politicized. But even in countries where, uh, you know, there is a political polarization around the virus, the media has done a fairly good job of explaining what the facts are, you know, um, that it is real, that we now know wearing masks helps and, and that sort of thing. Um, and particularly in New Zealand, you know, the government did a very good job of, of laying out the facts of how the virus works and why the approach the government was taking would stop the virus, but media did a very good job of, of breaking that down for people as well, explaining, you know, this bit of research shows that, that you know, a lockdown will be more effective than uh, just closing schools or, or what have you. Um, and I think played a very important role in bringing that broader message to um, you know, the, the broader public than just the people who in those early stages before lockdown were turning it, tuning into the 1 p.m. briefings because, you know, there were, those were still happening, but they were a lot less um, well viewed in, in, in the pre-lockdown era. Um, you know, balancing that with holding the government to account is, is not always super easy because you, on the one hand, don't want to feel like you are um, creating a, an illegitimate reason to criticize the response and to, to fracture uh, what was sort of fairly solid compliance with, uh, from people with restrictions. But, you know, there were things that um, could have been done better. We saw issues with the distribution of PPE. We saw issues with communication to frontline health workers, um, all that sort of stuff. But I think the media did a good job of um, sort of straddling those two responsibilities. One, explaining the you know, important things that people needed to know and to, you know, getting across what the government might not have been proactively offering, but was still important for, for the public to know. Um, I, I don't have much more to say on that of my own accord, but looking forward to the questions. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, just a reminder as well, you are welcome to enter questions into the Q&A box um, down the bottom of the Zoom bar. I'll pass over to Eugene Bingham now, uh, former co-host of Stuff's Coronavirus NZ podcast. Kia ora koutou. Uh, so yeah, Coronavirus NZ was produced by Stuff. Uh, Adam Dudding, my co-host, had the idea of, for it when he was driving into work on a Thursday, rang me and said, do you think we should do a podcast? We talked about it when we got in. When he got in, uh, we rang our boss, Patrick, one of our bosses, Patrick Crutzen, who said, great idea. Can you do it on Monday? So we recorded a pilot on the Friday, had the first episode on the Monday. So it was all very quickly thrown together. And that was the day that it was announced that we were going into level four lockdown, which threw some challenges at us. We sort of baked in from the start that we would have to produce it outside of the office as a kind of um, protection against the possibility of that happening. But of course, it was immediately the case. Uh, it also meant that we had to retreat to our own bedrooms. So for four weeks of the um, level four lockdown, Adam was in his bedroom with a, a jury rigged um, podcast studio when I was in mine, um, sort of 20 kilometers away. And that meant a few technical challenges, which we had to figure out and get around. Um, and we also had the challenge of 
recording interviews remotely, but thankfully everyone we um, spoke spoke with uh, was adept at that and, and got, um, got, got onto things. The objective of the show was to report on the main news headlines um, of what was going on, uh, to bring a bit of levity in the situation, which does sound weird, where there's a global pandemic on, but we did that through things like uh, a plague playlist. Um, and if you haven't listened to Thank You Baked Potato by Matt Lucas, I, I suggest you do. Uh, and we also had a, a feature interview. So a significant part of those feature interviews was science explainers, uh, where we had a range of excellent guests who would explain some of the complex issues. And it's interesting looking back uh, at some of the things that we had to do early on, for instance, um, what is a virus? Uh, you know, why does washing your hands work? Uh, how do vaccines work? Those sorts of things. So some very basic things, but we tried to sort of explain the science uh, to people, to our listeners. I also became weirdly obsessed with pangolins for a while, but anyway. Um, I cannot underestimate the value of the Science Media Centre and their Australian uh, colleagues. The, the service they provided in not only helping us uh, reach out to to experts and suggesting experts, but also sending updates um, and the latest science was remarkable and um, extremely appreciated. Um, and the scientists who agreed to come on were, were all, without exception, great communicators. So um, the SMC and, and people like Jenny who did that prep work have done a, done a great job, obviously. And it was good to be able to give them some breathing space to explain and, and provide some context. One of the biggest challenges was keeping up with developments, especially in those early days. The response, the science, the, the impact, it was real blink and you missed it stuff, which was a challenge when we were producing a, a once a day show. As soon as we hit publish, um, things would inevitably change and we'd be kicking ourselves going, ah, no. Um, and after the initial flurry, another challenge was the fact that it seemed there was a point where New Zealand and, and much of the world just, just diverged. It was almost like we'd gone off on an off ramp. Um, and you know, the scale of what was going on in America, for instance, um, and, and the way that they were coping it, it just seemed to be more and more unbelievable and became quite difficult to contextualize. And I still haven't figured out how to do that. Um, and it really does seem like another planet. So that was our little world in coronavirus NZ. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Eugene. Um, also on the same screen as Eugene is Kate Newton, uh, also at Stuff, a data journalist, but formerly at RNZ through the lockdown. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Dan says, I was working for Radio New Zealand at the time. Um, I think he referred to a data team. The data team was me. Um, <laughs> but essentially, um, I, I worked at Radio New Zealand in a kind of dual role um, as a data journalist and also a kind of long form features writer. And so right before lockdown happened, actually, my kind of first thoughts or experience with, with coronavirus was this overseas news story that was happening that kept on bumping mine and Guy on Eastman's stories about the New Zealand First Foundation like out of the lead spot on morning reports so like just huge annoyance um, and then I think like I don't know if everyone else remembers that feeling of probably the week before lockdown of just mounting stress and anxiety and every day there seemed to be a new development and I was like what what's happening what are we going to be doing so during that time, I think we were already kind of putting contingency plans in place uh, to work out how we were going to work from home, um, recognising that the little team that I was in at RNZ um, are not daily news reporters. They, they, for the large part, are features reporters. And so we knew that we were some of the first people that were going to get kicked out of the newsroom and sent home to, to make a little bit of space for everyone else. So that happened quite quickly. I think I was working from home, uh, yeah, the, the, those two days of level three, uh, right before level four happened. Um, I went home and kind of knew that I was gonna have to do some radio stuff. So it was a case of gathering up, you know, whatever equipment I could get my hands on at Radio New Zealand before exiting the building, uh, loading an office chair into the boot, um, taking all of that home. Um, I built a desk out of six cardboard boxes and two planks and that became my working from home uh, radio studio. Um, and so, yeah, things, I guess, that, that really came into play that we have been trained as radio journalists to do, but, you know, perhaps hadn't really put into practice all that often. Um, 
things like recording from home. Um, I think there's a photo of me still circulating on the internet um, underneath a really heavy wool blanket, uh, which was how I recorded uh, voice links and interviews and that sort of thing, just to muffle out any background sound. Um, and in terms of the work that I was doing, um, so part of that was, was the data stuff. So initially looking at global cases, um, this started before New Zealand, I think even had a reported case. I was looking at the John Hopkins University global data and starting to make some charts of that. Very quickly, the focus became, became about New Zealand's cases um, and then it was sort of a cascading thing as there were new data points added, I would try and incorporate them into visualization. So it started off with cases and whereabouts in the country they were. Then it became about reporting cases in hospital and in ICU. Um, there were some testing charts we made. Um, essentially, I because I was doing it on my own, I hit kind of a threshold where I had, I was like, okay, well, that's enough. I can't update any more charts without it taking up all of my time. So I think I had three charts that I updated live uh, watching the 1 p.m. briefings, and that was normally how I'd get the headline information and then scrape the Ministry of Health data later to make the more um, complicated charts, and then kind of one-off charts. And so I went through things like the Google movements data, um, NZTA reported traffic data on a weekly basis um, during lockdown, um, and other stuff like that that kind of gave a picture of not just what was happening with cases, but also with society in New Zealand during lockdown and during that time. Um, I also did some news feature reporting. Um, I kind of ended up being the, the Sean Hendy reporter. Um, <laughs> I think I was bugging Sean like two or three times a week um, for updates. And he and his colleagues at um, Te Punaha Matatini were really good at um, sharing early papers and draft papers they had and results and talking me through all of that and just to you know reciprocate what Eugene was saying um really really incredibly helpful I felt terribly guilty bringing up Sean and his colleagues because it was like I was literally interrupting somebody who was trying to like save the country um <laughs> to, to, to get him to explain in layperson terms all of these concepts um and just kind of on a a wider level. Um, I, I did actually find it quite difficult working from home. Um, this is the, the biggest story that I have ever covered. Probably most of my colleagues have ever covered and are ever likely to cover. And normally in that situation, you would be in a newsroom, there'd be a real hum going on, you could see what everyone's doing, everyone's kind of pitching and, and there's that real sense of being, you know, a, a helpful little cog in the machine. And I, I sort of characterised it to some colleagues during lockdown of knowing that you were a cog, but not seeing where you sort of fitted into the machine and just feeling like this little piece kind of spiraling through space. And so it did become quite hard to see where my reporting was fitting in um, and what value it had in the kind of grand scheme of things. So yeah, I mean, I, I found that tricky. Um, and I think the other thing as well that I found difficult later on was we sort of reached saturation point a little bit and it became, okay, what is there left to say about this that we haven't said already, you know, what are the new angles that are, that are left to cover um, without delving off into, you know, really wild alleyways that actually just, you know, what would maybe actively unhelpful in some cases. Um, but yeah, and I mean, as, as I say, it's, it's, it's still going on. Um, there are projects, I think, that are finally just getting back underway, uh, both at Stuff and at Radio New Zealand that really kind of fell by the wayside. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess yeah, that, that's all I have to say at this point. Sorry, there appears to be Sorry about that, Kate. That's um, okay. Sorry if I interrupted you there. Um, what, would you like to go on? No, no, I think I was I was pretty pretty well wrapped up. So yeah, throw to Jamie. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, and just another reminder as well, there's a Q&A box at the bottom if you have any questions uh, for these fine reporters. Um, and I'll hand over to New Zealand Herald science reporter, Jamie Morton. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for inviting me on the panel. Um, it's been fascinating hearing some of my colleagues share their experiences. Um, yeah, I can completely relate to what Kate was saying about it being this sort of slowly building story. Um, 
you know, I think some of the biggest science stories I've covered, um, you know, were the the two major earthquakes the last decade, and they were like suddenly bang earthquake, big story, um, and then everyone's covering it for months. This one was more like probably the Rena disaster, where you had like a ship on a reef, and then suddenly the implications of it were getting bigger and bigger. Um, I remember talking to some um, air quality scientists um, about the uh, ash coming over the Tasman from the Australian bushfires. Um, do you guys remember the Australian bushfires? Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, we, we were talking about it, you know, at that point, thinking there's some interesting, um, interesting stuff coming out of China right now. And um, it, it, you know, there, there was a few stories in the New Zealand media, and it started building and building. And um, I think one of the one of the first really good pieces of science journalism I read was um, Farrah Hancock at um, Newsroom did a really good piece on um, bats. Um, yeah, and so basically, the scientists I was talking about this too, uh, as the profile of the story got bigger and bigger, um, their own profiles were just basically started exploding. You know, they were on. Um, um, and stuff on TV NZ on on RNZ, um, yeah, and um, it was it was quite funny. It was you know uh, guys I talked to quite a lot and have done to you know have talked to a lot for the last ten years. Um, you, you find them as you usually do, and you could just really hear that stress, that exhaustion um, in their voice, thinking, "Ah, oh, not another reporter," you know. Um, uh, so yeah, but the, the other thing we, we noticed, um, and this has been touched on too, was how basically people started, you know, leaving or coming off social media and back to journalism, um, back to mainstream media. Um, our editor Murray Kirkman has touched on this this morning on the radio, how um, it kind of got people interested in journalism again. You know, I think people have been living this other life on Facebook or on Twitter or, or on Instagram and suddenly um, yeah, they, they were um, reading long form articles, they were watching TV news at six o'clock. Um, so that was really good. Um, from a practical standpoint, uh, there are just a million different angles to cover. Uh, and it, that got really tough. It was like, uh, what am I going to work on today? Um, what live stories am I going to be filing for the website? Um, what big explainer am I going to try to get up to tonight? Uh, and sort of how am I going to arrange my day and ensure that I get all this copy across the line? Um, so it was kind of like riding, riding two horses between those big lengthy explainers and trying to pump out sort of two or three stories um, each day. I think for those first few months, it was sort of like diving into a swimming pool and being underwater for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and just not having any, not being able to breathe. Um, uh, someone else has also touched on uh, the that real danger around sensationalizing. Um, you know, the, that was a real big thing at, at the outset of the pandemic. Um, uh, it wasn't just that, that kind of traditional risk of sensational journalism, you know, scary headlines. It was actually um, uh, putting a lot of that um, science that it was itself scary. Some of that early modeling um, was actually scary. It was about trying to put that into context and explain uh, the kind of evidence behind that and basically get people on board um, with the government's response. Um, I think, um, yeah, New Zealand should be really proud of the science journalism that's been turned out this year. I mean, there's just been so much of it. I, I can't remember a time in 10 years of writing science for the Herald that I've just seen so much sort of high quality work. Um, you know, just some highlights for me were um, Kate did a great piece on Sean Handy working from his um, breakfast table, um, doing modeling. Um, Mark's just done just long form piece after long form piece. Um, you know, the genomics of how uh, the virus came to New Zealand. Um, Mark and Matt Nippet also did just really good pieces based off um, those OIA dumps that came out. Um, Farrah Hancock, she's just done incredible work all year. Um, yeah, and I think there's no sign of this article, of this, sorry, this, this story letting up. I think it's still gonna be like the biggest story of 2021 when the vaccines arrive. 
and you know we're probably going to be just as exhausted at this point next year as we are now. Um, but no, in a weird way, I'm kind of looking forward to another year of coronavirus coverage. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Jamie. Um, and we're moving on to the Q&A section now. So I'll hand over to our co-host, Veronica Maduna, um, who's monitoring the audience questions. Um, Veronica, yeah, what's, what question do we have for the audience? Kia ora tato, and thanks to all your panellists for those. Um, uh, I can relate to every bit that everybody's mentioned during the last um, few months, really. Um, thanks for everybody else for tuning in. And we've got a few questions. So I'll take them from the top. Um, these are some specific to data journalism and some more broad, but I'll just take them from the top. There's a question to anybody who might want to answer it. Do any of the panellists have thoughts on the pros and cons of choosing to broadcast the unedited question time that happened after the 1 p.m. briefing? <laughs> I thought it was a good question to start with. <laughs> um, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this one. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the obvious pros of broadcasting the 1 p.m. briefing are being able to, A, create a sense of connection with the um, PM and Ashley Bloomfield and whoever else is presenting there and allowing them to get their message out to the public. And sometimes that could be sort of pretty important stuff that, you know, hearing directly from the prime minister, you know, COVID-19 uh, COVID is, is not curable through the ingestion of bleach, that can that can be helpful um, and, and perhaps more helpful than um, just some random journalist saying it. Um, Part of the cons were that, uh, and, and you know, the people who ended up being at the 1 p.m. Uh, press briefings were, for the most part, press gallery reporters um, who are, A, not science journalists, but B, um, you know, we have a, a, a specific way in which we interact with the prime minister and, and whoever happens to be on the stage at the Beehive Theatre at. Um, I don't think there's any hard feelings either way. There has been um, some, some concern that the journalists might be bullying the prime minister, but I can assure you that the prime minister does not feel bullied at all um, and uh, is probably quite, um, you know, quite used to, to the, the questioning style. Um, you know, in, in terms of whether it should be broadcast entirely unedited, uh, you know, I think the, the starting bit where they come out and make their speech is always helpful. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's a conversation to be had about whether the question and answer session should be broadcast or whether that's that's different because it's not actually a news product meant to be consumed like a, an article or a, a broadcast, um, you know, radio uh, piece or a TV piece. It's a, um, you know, it's part of the process of creating a news product. So people are asking questions multiple times with slightly different angles to them or just multiple times in general because they didn't get the answer they want. And that's because we're trying to get what we need to actually create our, our news product, not because, you know, the goal is to harass the prime minister or Ashley Bloomfield. Does anybody else want to pick up on that? Yeah, no. I, I... Oh, sorry, you go, you go, Eugene. I was just gonna say, sorry, Jenny. Um, I thought that, um, I agree, the, the problem was around the questions and um, I think it became, part of the was sort of the dehumanizing <laughs> of the press gallery journalists and uh, people just became names. Everyone knew who Toba was, um, you know, and, and so on, it, just by first name, uh, which didn't help, I think. And I saw an interesting idea. We spoke to uh, Peter Bale, actually, um, about an idea of putting the cap, turning the camera around. So at least you could see that these were actually real people um, who were asking questions. But I, I, I tend to agree with Mark that I'm not sure how helpful having the question part section of that uh, presentation was helpful, where the first part I think was good public service. I might, sorry, I might just throw something in there as well, is that um, as a journalist who wasn't often at the 1 p.m. briefings, um, well, neither, <laughs> who was in Auckland in my bedroom watching them like everyone else, um, but one of the things, this kind of flow on effects of having that lengthy Q&A section was that there were kind of health officials and communications people within the Ministry of Health who began to view that as the one opportunity journalists had each day to ask questions. And it's the, as you all saw, it's, it's quite a combative, um, aggressive, often quite competitive uh, 
forum that questions are asked in. And there were often questions that I had that were maybe, maybe needed uh, more time to answer. Uh, perhaps we didn't necessarily want everyone else to hear us asking those questions. And it became very difficult to convince people to answer questions outside of that forum. So yeah, that for me was sort of a, a flow on difficulty of, of those 1PM briefings. Yeah, I agree with Kay. I was going to say basically the exact same thing. Um, I mean, I was sitting in Auckland also watching and these journalists who go in, they get given about 30 questions from um, all of the journalists saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. And we're just sitting there watching, hoping that the question will get through. It's just such high pressure at that time um, that, you know, it, it does, it, it, we come across like we're absolutely savage, but it's the only way that we might be able to get something through. The other thing is, I agree with Kate, the number of times that I um, emailed or called um, all of government or the Ministry of Health and they fobbed me off to the 1pm presser. They just said, um, ask this at one. And sometimes they're really complicated questions that take a lot of explaining and um, need a long time to answer and I think that um, yeah a lot of the time they were kind of just able to say oh you know I don't have that on me at the moment or I'll, I'll get that to you later and then never hear back from them so it, it was quite stressful <laughs> actually for us as well. I'll just weigh in really really quickly on one last thing I totally agree with all of that and there was probably a four or five month period where I didn't bother to email the Ministry of Health asking questions because I knew what the answer would be. Um, uh, the other thing is you can tell the difference between a press conference where the PM was there or where just Ashley Bloomfield was there because the questions could be a lot more scientific, a lot more, uh, there was just time and space for you to ask questions about the science and, and the reasoning behind it and that sort of thing. Whereas when the PM is there, it's not, you know, A, it's more political inherently, but B, you know, people are asking questions that about things that aren't COVID-19 or about things that aren't the health or science aspects of COVID-19, things like when will the borders reopen or you know, have you heard about this experimental treatments ingesting bleach or whatever. Um, but you know, it doesn't, you don't get to, to um, take time to build up a line of questioning and, and get answers for something that might be fairly complex. Cool. Thank you, Jamie. I'll, do you want to jump in there or for, there's more questions coming along similar lines. So maybe I'll just go on to the next one following up quite nicely. Um, how many panelists have found interactions on social media or how have you found interactions on social media during this year? Um, this comes from Kay and she says, I've appreciated asking a Juno on Twitter if they could ask a question and hearing it in the day's press briefing. Thanks, Marks and others. So general question about your interaction, perhaps with your listeners, readers, viewers on social. I guess I'll go again. I'm very active on Twitter. Some might say too active. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed actually when someone would ask me a question, if I didn't know the answer, I, I would go and ask it for them if I, if I thought it was interesting enough. Um, you know, the, the flip side of the interaction on social media are that there are some people who will engage with you from a bad faith perspective and they are not trying to actually get answers to the questions that they're asking. Um, from the second outbreak onwards, I've just taken to blocking anyone who, who's doing anything like that because I think the, the impact of just even letting them, you know, ride along in the replies to my tweets is, you know, that's a negative impact of if someone who is genuinely uncertain about something coronavirus related stumbles along and, and reads that and thinks it's true. Um, but, you know, I think it was a very helpful way to be able to directly clarify misunderstandings and so on, because it is a complex issue. And even if you take the most care in the world, you're not gonna be able to get through, um, you know, an entire article while making everything crystal clear and super explicit. So being able to correct misconceptions or, or answer minor questions was helpful, I think, for me and for other people. Yeah, I, I loved it actually. Um, I think I, I said before that I, even though we were all in lockdown and we couldn't see very many people, I actually felt most connected that I've ever felt to, um, you know, people who were watching or reading. Um, people were just sort of getting in touch with questions and, and we welcome that. That's, that's why we do it. We answer the questions that um, people have um, to the point where even, you know, people were stopping us on the street and asking, um, you know, 
uh, or even giving us story ideas concerned about, you know, for example, my, my neighbour, uh, she's an essential worker and she had questions about PPE and we ended up doing a story. And um, yeah, it, it was really good, actually. I enjoyed it. Um, and I think we had probably the most feedback ever over, over lockdown because everyone was just glued to, to TV or, or online. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, it wasn't necessarily uh, social media, but uh, our inboxes were overflowing. Uh, you, other journalists probably found the same uh, with some you know, people who were, you could sense their concern, um, but also, as, as the others have said, really good questions. Uh, I remember uh, getting questions from people in, in um, managed isolation saying, you know, asking, for instance, why aren't we being tested at that, that point of the... the, the um, management of the, the outbreak, um, which were really good questions and which led to new stories. So I think having that ability to be able to communicate back and forth with uh, public and, and with our listeners and, and readers was, was really helpful. Excellent. I think that's a really good point that, um, you know, being connected with people where you otherwise wouldn't know how to get hold of them who were, you know, not at home, not, at, not on their cell phone. Um, Next one is a bit um, more about data journalism. Have panelists picked up any new technology or data analysis skills? What top tips would you share? Any great website resources? <laughs> Kate Newton touched on this. Um, has she built a skills toolkit? <laughs> Here's a suggestion. <laughs> Uh, no, is the short answer uh, to that question. I feel like um, there was actually so much work to get through that there wasn't a lot of that kind of um, sort of future proofing that could happen, unfortunately. Um, and actually my my leaving RNZ caused a bit of a headache because I had I was the only you know practicing data journalist at RNZ and I left and you know, had said to them, look, I really need to teach somebody else how to update these these charts and if you want to keep publishing them. And it was like, yeah, 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 we're going to find someone to do that. And then like literally the, the last day that I was at Radio New Zealand, I was like on Zoom to a colleague trying to walk her through the process. Um, so that was really handled quite badly, uh, both by me and by my organisation, uh, just in terms of um, trying to, to keep that stuff going. Um, in terms of picking up new skills, not not so much new tools or skills as a kind of continued uh, development of what I was already learning. Um, so I'm I'm a self-taught uh, user um, and was also using um, Tableau uh, for some of the charts that we used. Um, simply because uh, the long story short, Radio New Zealand's um, website infrastructure is very clunky, and that was essentially the only interactive data visualization tool that the website could host. Um, so we were sort of stuck with that to an extent. Um, I did get probably better at analysing stuff on the fly um, and kind of gradually sort of improving, I guess, my data set as I went through, if that makes sense. Um, there have been some really positive things that have come out of the whole pandemic and the lockdown, though, with regards to data. Um, the Science Media Centre, thank you very much, um, set up a channel for all of the sort of full-time data journalists in New Zealand, um, or, you know, even part-time. So that was myself, uh, Farrah Hancock from Newsroom, um, Keith and Chris from The Herald, um, my now colleague Felipe here um, at Stuff. And yeah, I think I think that was the core group, oh, and Chris McDowell, who's not a journalist, but makes incredible data visualizations if anyone's familiar with his work. Um, and he was doing that for the spin-off among other people um, during the pandemic or during lockdown. Um, so that that was a really cool forum to share ideas. Um, there was a lot of bitching about the Ministry of Health's um, data publishing. Um, we, I think, got our first CSB as opposed to an Excel spreadsheet um, last week, maybe the week before, like 230 days after they first started publishing the data. So there were a lot of frustration around that. And I think that in, in the future, I am hoping that we might be able to have some conversations with government officials and data people working within government to talk about how they actually share that information in a user-friendly way, um, in a way that doesn't constantly keep changing. That was the really, really difficult thing um, 
was that they kept on changing the format on us. So, um, you know, it, it kept on breaking everyone's scrapers um, or breaking everyone's spreadsheets, um, and that that was frustrating. Um, but yeah, through that, I think, yeah, there, there will be some good things that will come out of that um, and through that collaboration that the Science Media Centre kind of helped along. I don't know if that Thanks. answers the question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a scope to collect some, you know, toolkits and um, help in that space. Um, this is a question for everybody and um, comes on the back of, a, I'm assuming, a scan, a scan session yesterday on misinformation. Did you find this? The level of misinformation to be any more of a challenge to avoid or consider in COVID coverage compared to you know considering balance in regular day-to-day -day coverage assuming regular day-to-day -day coverage of scientific topics so you know was this mis misinformation a bigger deal this time or a bigger challenge than in other science stories um yeah for sure i mean i think um everyone here could basically relate to the fact that it felt like we were cleaning up Facebook's mess every day, you know, um, uh, like just even from friends and family just emailing me saying, hey, have you heard about this or can you chase this up? And um, yeah, I think um, it felt like it felt like kind of journalists were sort of fighting a fire that Facebook was lighting at the same time. Um, social media is, is, is great for all sorts of things, but uh yeah at, 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 at this point it was sort of like creating information viruses that was helping fuel the real one um yeah uh but having been a science reporter for 10 years i don't think there is a comparable story where there has been such a misinformation or even disinformation narrative running alongside um what's been happening um so yeah, we played, I think, a big part in that, but um, uh, it also got quite blurry um, because um, aside from what was just basically clear conspiracy theories, um, you know, there was there was another element actually within science itself. There was, you know, groups of, um, you know, what we call contrarians really that were countering um, the majority of the epidemiology community and so as um, journalists um, we had to really um, kind of lobby our, our editors and our fellow colleagues about you know uh, context and the importance of um, um, you know just not falling into a, a false equivalence or false balance trap when talking to some of these people yeah Kate, did you want to add something? <laughs> Sorry, Eugene was just struggling with the unmute button. Um, yeah, the, the, I guess the, the counter to what Jamie is saying as well, and something that I think um, Radio New Zealand grappled with a little bit early on, although I think it, it struck the right tone um, for, for the most part, was actually at the other end of the spectrum, you were, <laughs> because the 1pm briefings were kind of being streamed unedited live um, and then we were essentially like debating turning around what was being said in those briefings and immediately putting that into bulletins and news stories and you know broadcasting large chunks of it there was also this like feeling of like how do we do this without actually just sounding like a government propaganda tool some of the time um, you know because you are wanting to uh, keep the message consistent and clear uh, without just sounding like you have sort of been co-opted as the government's like broadcast communications arm. So I think there was a little bit of discussion early on among like editors and senior managers about, you know, like how, how far, you know, we could, you know, push them or, or you know, how, how you would counter that to, to make it clear that you were actually, you know, the sort of independent um, news media organisation as well. Just in terms of the um, other examples, I think the election election coverage, um, some of it you had to fight quite a lot of misinformation or, or um, wacko stuff as well. So there, I mean, it's not unusual, unfortunately. Um, the, the, in terms of the conspiracy theories, uh, that that was one of the um, 
only examples really where we struggle to get scientists to come on our podcast to talk about them because they felt you know awkward about that and I could understand that we did too it was sort of that balance between um, providing information to knock down wacko conspiracy theories versus um, giving them air we chose to um, we felt it was better to explain it without giving um, the peddlers airtime so that, that's how we dealt with that. Uh, over to you, Mark. Yes, sorry, I lost my mouse, but I found it again. Um, the, uh, the the interesting thing about COVID-19 conspiracy theories is that they're, they've sort of formed this like meta, it's a meta conspiracy theory in which you can fit anything. And to some extent, conspiracy theories are like this. But if you look at something like 9-11 truthers or Holocaust deniers, you know, they're not going to be able to fit in an election and a pandemic and uh, you know child sex trafficking and so on. But I think a lot of the conspiracy theories that I see um, around COVID-19 come from that QAnon sort of uh, section and um, that you can just fit anything into. Like no matter what comes across your desk, you can rationalize it from, you know, Trump resigns uh, or Trump, Trump says that the transition be can begin. Well, obviously this is just part of the broader plan to trap the Democrats into this, that, and the other. Um, and, and likewise, you know, everything about the, the virus, even people catching it and still not believing it's real, like it, it's, a, it's a very powerful force. And, and I don't think that anyone really has a proper answer for how you can totally combat it. You know, we know some strategies are better than others, but I don't think there's a, a solution for it. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And um, uh, for those not familiar with Mark's work as well, he's also on the conspiracy theory round at Newsroom. <laughs> um, we've got a question here from Susan Rapley. Um, she says, it seems most of the panelists are journalists who found their way to science reporting um, through this COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, except for Jamie Morton, who's the NZ Herald science uh, reporter. So for you panelists who've just been tuned into science reporting um, recently, what, I suppose what was the biggest challenge you faced in terms of switching into science storytelling um, on a dime and doing it every day? Eugene, would you like to go? Yeah, all right. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, uh, having been around for 30 years, um, I have reported on science before, although this was the first time that I've done it on a daily daily basis. Um, and, and usually, like probably for the last 10 years plus, I've been doing uh, long-form journalism, so going away and, and getting time to think about stuff and, and, and dig away at things. As opposed to suddenly being thrust into um, daily journalism, so I guess I guess for me, and I touched on this earlier, the struggle was uh, keeping up with everything because you were trying to um, produce work, but also read papers and read updates and um, keep up with the science. Which is why I think the Science Media Centre work in that regard was was fantastic. Um, as was, as Jamie mentioned, some of the fantastic work of, of our colleagues um, around the country, um, just being able to, to, to read what was going on and see what was going on and figure things out. So for me, that was the difficult thing was, was, was keeping up. Um, you know, there was so much changing, especially in those early days, um, that it was a real struggle to do that and to, to make sure that you were finding reliable sources and um, reliable you know, scientific work uh, as much as anything. So that was my experience. Yeah, um, I'd say as well that, um, uh, like Eugene, I do have some background. I was a health reporter full time for three or four years at the start of my career. Um, and during that time, I actually covered swine flu. So it's a little bit of deja vu, but just on a grand level um, when, when COVID came around. But um, I think that in a way, how newsrooms ended up handling it, or at least from what I witnessed at Radio New Zealand, was that you know, unlike Eugene, who because of the podcast had to kind of have this high level umbrella overview of everything that was going on, um, I and a lot of other reporters were sort of able to 
kind of hone in on a particular patch. Um, so like, as I mentioned earlier, I basically stuck to covering the modeling um, and the New Zealand research around that, which meant that as I was going along, I wasn't coming to, to a sort of scientific concept or a particular angle of the story that was fresh to me each time. It was kind of like incrementally building knowledge, building up a bit of a rapport with the researchers that I was talking to. Um, and so, been in a position where I, I had enough of an understanding to know what was new, what was kind of significant, um, and hopefully how to convey that in a, in a simple but not simplistic way uh, to, to readers. Um, and I think there were, there were, you know, other of my colleagues at Radio New Zealand who did the same thing for other aspects of the science. Um, yeah, I, I had a little bit of experience doing um, reporting science at um, TVNZ before I moved on to the late news as well. But I think um, one thing that was quite difficult for all of us was with television, we get given sort of a minute 30 to two minutes tops to tell a story that people will sit and watch once and have to understand. Um, if it didn't, if they didn't understand it, most likely they're not going to rewind and, and look at it again. So it was, yeah, just a... Um, trying to figure out what are the most important aspects and um, yeah I think like Kate said simplifying but not making it too simple um, because you know Kiwis aren't dumb um, so it was just trying to figure out exactly yeah what was most important and what is how do we present it in the easiest way that people will look at it once and listen to it once and be able to understand it. Um, I, I kind of like Kate, I think I ended up um, doing a, a sort of narrower uh, set of, of coronavirus work, a lot of the stuff on like epidemiology, public health, uh, health systems. Uh, Farah Hancock, um, who's, who's now at RNZ, um, did, uh, you know, the clinical stuff, the vaccines. I think that the most um, non-population health I got was, was those genome pieces. Um, the thing that worked for me was just actually when I had a big piece in mind, I would be talking it through with anyone who would listen anyways. And if they didn't get what I was saying, or if they didn't seem excited by it, I knew that I wasn't explaining it well enough. So I think by virtue of particularly if I'm taking a week to write a piece, talking about it every day for two or three hours with the unfortunate people stuck in my flat, um, you know, I, I managed to figure out ways in which I can convey in a, a complex idea like genomics um, in a way that, that a, a lay person might be able to understand it. Sorry, I was just going to add something um, that the SMC were so helpful throughout this entire time. Um, I did feel really comfortable whenever there was something that I was having trouble understanding um, to just call and ask. Um, and quite often um, someone was able to put, put me in touch with someone who um, would listen to my um, silly questions um and yeah so i i do i do want to say thank you to everyone who took a stupid phone call from me because it was really helpful fantastic thank you so much everyone we've got two minutes left so we'll um end on a shameless self uh, promotion question from ellen rikers um do you have any particular pieces or stories that were highlights that you've really enjoyed pulling together um and while you're thinking about that i'll just read out um lovely comments from vanessa young um saying listening to all the panelists speak uh, she's touched by how much you all care how much you worry about contacting or bothering the key scientists um and how hard you're working to make a difference and how front and central the public are for you um, so does anyone uh, have any uh, particular stories or pieces um, that you'd like to promote just in the minute before we wrap up? Start um, mine's a, mine's a non-science one. I'm um, sorry. My favourite story actually that I ended up working on was a story about my street. It was kind of almost like a first person, uh, like in that first week or two of lockdown, um, talking to a whole bunch of my neighbours and I'd only just moved into that street um, and hearing about their experiences and what they were going through. Um, and for me, that was just like, almost like a calming exercise to do it because it felt so kind of anxious and stressed up until that point. And then it was like lockdown came, I was like, ah, and then I was just talking to my neighbors and just kind of like putting forth this little beautiful, um, very narrow sort of slice of life in New Zealand. Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's my plug, <laughs> sorry. Um, I enjoyed working on a piece um, about the testing system where I got a, a, a breather from the daily um, grind to be able to just 
uh, talk to ESR, talk to diagnostic labs, talk to people at Canterbury DHB and others just about how they managed to get the testing system up and running, um, which I still think is a heroic effort um, and, and one example of the, of the many um, around this country where people did remarkable, remarkable work, um, un unsung to be able to um, get us through the worst, fingers crossed, of the pandemic. Um, I don't know if everyone else had this as well, but I had a million people asking me just before um, level level four what the rules actually were. Um, a lot of people were confused constantly. So I think for me, it was putting together um, little explainers for this is what it means for level four, this is level three, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. No, you can't go for a surf um, in Piha, but you could go for a swim at your local beach, things like that. Um, and also I agree with Kate, some of my favorite stories have not really been science um, related um, more. Um, how people celebrated Easter and also um, I really liked um, Anzac Day as well. I think it was really special and um, sometimes we get really caught up doing these stories about what you need to know, what you need to know and it's also nice to do stories about Kiwis and our spirit and that we, we're all okay and that we'll get through it. <laughs> Jamie? Yeah, hey. Um... No, my favourite piece was getting to explain to people what an mRNA vaccine is because otherwise there's no other way my editors would let me write about that sort of stuff. Um, but could I, if I could just point out some some really cool pieces that have impressed me like um, this year from colleagues. I think I've mentioned a few of them. Um, but the ones I had written down, so there was um, Mark's um, two-part series on how the virus came to New Zealand. It's kind of like... Um, the Godfather parts one and two of science journalism this year. Um, Farah Hancock, um, she did an amazing um, piece with David Heyman from Massey University um, about sort of how the virus sort of leapt from um, whether it was bats or pangolins or whatever. That was a really good piece on sort of disease ecology. Um, um, both Mark and Matt Nippet did um, just these epic pieces of, built off, you know, like dozens of different um, documents that were dumped by the government at once under the IA. Um, obviously, um, Eugene's um, podcast series. Uh, and, uh, oh, yeah, the other one, sorry, was, um, I mentioned this earlier too, um, um, Kate's piece with um, Sean Hendy just sort of describing modelling um, from his breakfast table under lockdown. I just thought it was a really cool, cool read. Yeah. Um, I would say anything that takes 15 minutes or longer to read, I'm pretty proud of. Um, shouldn't be, but I am. Uh, I really like the genomic stuff, the um, pandemic preparedness stuff, because I think that'll be a big story for the next year as well. And um, anything touching on the sort of contrarian Simon Thornley Sweden, should we stop doing elimination stuff? I think I, I um, enjoyed being able to just dig into some of that data and give some context for how different life is most other places from life in New Zealand. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, everyone. Um, we've breezed through this hour. Um, uh, apologies to anyone whose questions we haven't managed to uh, get to. Um, so thank you so much uh, to everyone in the audience for attending. Thank you so much for the panelists for taking the time to be here. Um, and you can join us uh, again tomorrow at the SCANS conference uh, at 12.30 again for a session on purposeful storytelling with speaker coach DK. Um, and also on tomorrow at 4.30 is the Story Collider Story Slam. Um, so newly trained storytellers are putting their skills to work. They're telling personal tales with a pinch of science. So matewa everyone. Have a lovely day. <laughs>